Hi, welcome back to educator.com. This lesson is going to take a look at the relationship between HTML and XML. If you've ever done any code level web design and you've been following the lesson so far, you've noticed a great similarity between HTML syntax and XML syntax. So in this lesson, we're going to take a look at where those similarities arise from and more critically, what the differences between the two languages are. So in this lesson, we're going to spend a little time reviewing some of the features of HTML. We're going to look at how it differs from XML, and then we're going to take a look at an updating of HTML as an XML document type, and this is known as XHTML. Let's take a look at a HTML document, one you're probably pretty familiar with, the Google homepage. So here's the Google homepage, and I'm also going to take a look at the source code for this page, and we're going to take a look at some of the features of HTML as a markup language. First of all, HTML has specific requirements. For example, it's divided into a head element, which contains information about the page, and then later on that head element ends and we begin the body element, which actually contains your visible web page content. An HTML document must have those two sections to it. Although what's interesting is that the tags for those two sections are optional, and as, it, as are in fact the tags for the top level element HTML. Going back up to the top here, we see that we've got an HTML start tag here. We've got a head start tag. And then down here, we've got a head end tag and the beginning of a body tag here with some attributes like we learned about. But at the very end, where we would expect to see a closing body element and a closing HTML element if we were in XML mode, we don't see anything. In HTML, or at least certain versions of the language, those tags are optional. You don't need to include them because they're implied. In contrast, some HTML elements are required. For example, every HTML element must have a title element. Let's take a look at the title element. Okay. You don't have to put anything in the element if you don't want to. It's usually a good idea to, though, because certain elements in HTML have built-in processing. If you're writing a program that claims to work with HTML in a standard way, there are certain things it has to do. For example, the contents of the title element are supposed to be put in the browser's document window. So if I go back to my browser, I say the title is called Google, and the word Google appears in the tab title or the document title, depending on how you have your browser set up. So once again, there are specific sections in HTML that make it the document type that it is. Some of the tags are optional. Certain elements are required, and there's built-in processing for certain types of elements. In contrast, XML has no defined structure. You can use XML to define the structure of a document, but there's no particular sections that an XML document has to have. In contrast to freer versions of HTML, XML elements must have a start tag and an end tag. There are no required elements in XML. You can use or not use whichever elements you please, although you can define which elements are required or not required. And in contrast to HTML, where certain elements will behave a certain way in a browser or other HTML-compatible software, there's no assumed processing for any XML document that you create or any XML element type that you create, unless you're working with some established standard XML file type. After XML appeared, the web consortium got to work trying to reestablish HTML as an XML document type using its restricted syntax. And they came up with XHTML. In XHTML, all tags are required. You can't get away with what the Google homepage does with not including the closing body tag or the closing HTML tag. 
And you're required to use lowercase tag names. Early on in HTML, a lot of people like to set apart their markup by using all capitals. XHTML specifically says you must use lowercase. And as an example of an XHTML file, we can go right to the educator.com homepage, or you can even look at the source code of the page you're viewing this video on, and you'll see something very similar. Here we see that the, there's a document type that's been declared as HTML, although we're using specifically an XHTML dialect called XHTML 1.0 transitional. And we see that all of our elements are open and closed. For instance, here's our HTML start tag, our top level element that has to be in every XML file. And at the very end of the file, we see that we have a closing element. And here's our closing tag for our body, knowing that our body starts earlier in the document. We see that everything has a start tag and an end tag, even down to list items, paragraphs, things that in more traditional uh, freer syntax HTML you don't have. So there's all this tag information that is required. So all tags are required in HTML must use lowercase tag names. Now, when the web consortium came up with XHTML. They had grand designs on how it was going to take over the web. Everybody was going to redo their documents to be XHTML compliant. And because XML is easier to program for, you'd be able to uh, quickly have more intelligent processing of web page contents. Uh, the first version of XHTML came out around the turn of the century. And uh, we've seen rather poor adoption ever since, or confused adoption. Part of the problem was a lack of coherent marketing. The last version of HTML published as HTML was in the late 1990s, and there hasn't been a completed standard of HTML published since then. A lot of people have wondered, well, where did HTML go? How come it hasn't been updated? Well, it was updated. It was updated in XHTML, but the Web Consortium didn't do a very good job of marketing that fact. Another problem was that they included three versions. The last version of HTML, uh, version 4.01, had three versions. You had strict, which was a more XML type. You had um, transitional, which is what everybody actually used. And then you had frame set for back when we liked frames on our web pages, which hardly anyone, anyone ever uses anymore. And then when they created XHTML 1.0, they used the same three versions. And as they tried to update XHTML, come up with new versions, people wondered, why can't it be transitional? I like transitional. Uh, so there was a lack of adoption on that part as people became confused about what versions were available. This resulted in a lot of poor authoring of documents. And as a result, poor support of these new document types. Because if you're a programmer writing a browser, um, People don't care if the file they're looking at is not written in a standardized version of HTML. They want your browser to show it properly, which means you have to do a lot of extra background programming to make up for authoring mistakes. Uh, as a result, you don't really have the desire to do any more programming to add extra features, so you don't bother. As a result, XHTML's future is somewhat in doubt. The new version of HTML called HTML5 have pay some lip service to support for XHTML, but they haven't really gone into detail as to how XHTML5 will look in contrast to the regular HTML. So we don't know the future of XHTML, but we have seen some of the differences between XML and XHTML. So in this lesson, we've seen these similarities. We've seen the differences between XML and HTML primarily due to their purpose. HTML is a document type. XML is a system for defining document types. And we've taken a look at the initial stab of rebranding HTML as an XML document known as XHTML. Thank you for visiting educator.com.